So most of my presentation uh, is going to be focused, obviously, on my particular bent, uh, the library box uh, piece of technology. But uh, you can apply a lot of the, the, the theoretical stuff I'm going to talk about near the end to any of, the, any of the pieces of software that I just mentioned and a lot that I didn't mention. So what is a library box? What is, why, why do we care? Um, the, the general description that I use is portable private digital distribution. It's a, a, a small piece of hardware. I'm holding one here, and there's a handful of other, of other um, options for hardware here. A little tiny hockey puck shaped thing. This is all commodity hardware, very, very inexpensive, very cheap. That, um, that you can use to develop, to provide access to digital objects in a very private, controlled, small space. So that's, uh, that's this thing uh, that I'm holding here. And the, the general idea to kind of wrap your head around it is this is, you know, the, the, the internet is big. Um, but what happens if you want to break a little piece of it off and take it with you somewhere, right? Maybe somewhere where there isn't any infrastructure. Right? Maybe somewhere where the infrastructure that is in the area has been damaged in some way. So how do you, de how do you deploy digital information? How do you take the web with you into places that don't have anything? Well, you can do it with these sorts of devices. Library Box works with open source software, standard web technologies. It provides its own Wi-Fi signal that is obviously anything with Wi-Fi can attach to it. Um, and then anything with a web browser can interact with it. So again, standard web technologies. Uh, cell phones, laptops, desktops, tablets, e-readers, anything like that. If you get bored, there is one that is running here in the room. Um, the SSID is Library Box. And if you just want to like catch up on your Khan Academy studies or read some Wikipedia articles or watch Plan 9 from Outer Space, um, that's all. Uh, being served to you right now by this little battery-powered box that I can put in my pocket. So I'm going to go through very quickly uh, the history of Library Box and kind of how it got where it is now uh, before we go into the, the future of it. It started with Pirate Box. Pirate Box was originally developed by Dr. David Darts at NYU as a sort of art project. It wasn't even really... Um, wasn't, wasn't really seen at the time as a, as a technology project even. It was mostly about uh, anti-copyright stance. Uh, he developed it as an anonymous way to share copyrighted material. That really was the kind of art project that he put together. And it was big. The original, uh, the original instantiation of Pirate Box re required some fairly big hardware, lead acid battery sealed up in a... In a um, uh, lunchbox with the little external antennas, and you know, it was a pretty hefty little suitcase size sort of thing. Um, shortly after he rolled out the kind of initial code base for Pirate Box, I saw it and got the idea that if we could man manipulate it a little bit, it would be really interesting in a library context to be able to share information out in the world, right? To take, again, to break off a piece of the web, to take a piece of the library out into the world with you and be able to share it directly with people. So in the spring of 2012, I um, forked uh, Pirate Box and then uh, came up with uh, Library Box version one. Um, very, very, very prototype. It uh, relied on a lot of uh, customization through uh, the terminal. You had to go in and really kind of hack at Linux for a little while to make it work. So it was a great proof of concept, but nobody was going to use it. Like nobody was actually going to build one of these things because it required a, a fair amount of a uh, fair amount of hackery, especially in the library world. There's just not that many people that were going to go through the trouble. So um, in fall of 2012, I changed the installation process and uh, basically automated it to make it a little bit easier for people to uh, to build. This is when the project really started getting some traction and started taking off. And I saw kind of what it could be, where, where it could go after um, it started getting some attention in a variety of places out in the world. So then with the, the 2.0 release, I decided I really wanted to go big or go home. I wanted to have something that was really a reasonable piece of interesting technology that people could take out into the world. 
And that included uh, the ability to have statistics on it, uh, the actual easy installation, something that didn't require you to be able to tell that into Linux and run terminal commands. Um, it needed to be responsive because obviously <laughs> responsiveness is an important thing for web design. It needed to have easily customizable web pages so that if a library or other group wanted to customize the experience, they could do that. And I wanted to expand the hardware choices. At the time, we were really only playing with kind of one little corner of the hardware world. And I wanted to make it as um, international as possible because not all hardware is available in every country. So to make it kind of worldwide, I wanted to, uh, to expand the, the hardware choices. So uh, I needed money. And when you have an idea and you don't have money, one of the options is Kickstarter. So I went to, uh, I went to Kickstarter in uh, June of 2013. And I launched a Kickstarter campaign at the American Library Association annual conference in Chicago in the summer of 2013. Um, I thought at the time that uh, I needed a few thousand dollars, right? I was aiming very low. It was going to be a small project. It wasn't going to be a big deal. I was going to need three or four thousand dollars to kind of, you know, slide a developer to let them do some, some custom coding for me. No, no, no big deal. So I, uh, so I launched it, and uh, it was funded in six hours. In two days, I was, uh, I was over double my goal. And then on about day three, this guy came in the picture. Um, and if you don't know, that's Corey Doctorow, um, famous sci-fi author, EFF evangelist, um, and generally all around famous on the internet guy. Uh, and he was at the American Library Association conference. And I had a chance to meet him, and I had a chance to show him Library Box, which led to Boing Boing doing a story about it, and um, eventually Corey himself backing it. And it turns out when the largest blog in the world backs your Kickstarter project, well, you know, things happen. So uh, over the course of the 30 days, I ended up at 1,000% of my goal. And it showed me that there really was a like, desire for this sort of technology that allowed people to run private, uh, the private sharing of digital information to a small group of people out in the world. It's kind of a proof of interest. So that was delivered. That information, uh, that particular code base, we worked on it um, post, post Kickstarter. We got the 2.0 out in the spring of 2014, and then we went to the next one, right? We started, we started the next round of development because it can always be better. And this time around, I ended up with a Knight Foundation prototype grant for the project, which is fantastic. And in this particular, uh, this particular round, we added a lot of things that I think are incredibly important for the, the kind of future of the project. We added localization and internationalization for language, so that we're using, uh, we have um, a translation engine that's doing uh, internationalization. Uh, we expanded the hardware reach of the code base. We added a mini DLNA server, so you can actually use it as a, as a multimedia server for your smart TVs and things like that. Um, we added uh, res more responsiveness in the, in the HTML and directory listings, and then we added an automatic updater so that on the next rounds of updates, we get some automatic, um, some automatic updating going on. Uh, these are the languages. We're at 11 languages now, and I know there are a lot of people in here that speak more than one language. So one of the things that I will talk to you about later is, hey, if you would like to help me internationalize it yet further, that is something that I would love to do. So how is the project being used? This is really the interesting bit, right, is how, how are people using the project? What are they doing with the hardware? How are they dealing with, um, with it? And I will say, like any good tool, it's being used in ways that people didn't mean for it to be used, right? I, uh, I developed it initially with the thought, really, for kind of libraries and education. It turns out um, there's a lot of, a lot of other uses. Um, the, the typical uses do tend to be uh, in the education and library space. Uh, a lot of libraries are using it for outreach. They'll preload it with uh, electronic books uh, and movies, things like that, and then go out into their community on their bookmobiles or other kind of you know mobile sharing um, sites, and use Library Box to share things that way. Um, it's being used internationally. This is the uh, State Library of Queensland tweeting 
about the, uh, their use. They're actually making library boxes then going out into incredibly rural areas of Australia. If you know anything about that part of Australia, it is, it is rural beyond belief. Um, and they are going out uh, and delivering electronic things out into the world using library boxes. Um, it's being used when libraries do author talks to, to deliver uh, when an author agrees, obviously, to license their books for free distribution, as Cory Doctorow does. Uh, when he goes to libraries, often libraries freely share his books, right, using a library box. It's being used in pop-up libraries. This is actually a small town in northern France where uh, they built a little pop-up library next to a uh, bus station and included a library box as a way to deliver information at point of need to people who are just you know, standing around waiting on buses. It's being used by the Monterey Bay Aquarium to deliver uh, scholarly papers out to remote Pacific islands, which I thought was really kind of a fascinating use of it. Uh, as a series of researchers that are uh, going out into you know very, very, very tiny remote islands on the Pacific, but they need to be able to share scholarly research that they found with the people, uh, with the researchers that are already there. And they're using library boxes as a way to, uh, to move that information back and forth. It's being used at Fort Knox, Kentucky, at the Army base, um, both as a, uh, as, a, as a tool to promote the library and as a tool to share library resources with people that are, that are, uh, that are just coming in. Um, there have been robots built with library box on them. Uh, this was uh, a robot that was built by uh, Steve Teary at the Detroit Public Library uh, uh, for a maker day that they had there at the library. And it just basically wandered the floor sharing books, right? Which I thought was pretty fantastic. Um, there is a librarian named Patrick Sweeney who has the book boat that sails the Pacific uh, coast of California delivering books to small coastal communities uh, who has a library box on the book boat to share uh, information as he docks and uh, can share things that way. It's being used by corporations. Uh, these are two of, my, uh, two of my favorite examples, SparkFun Electronics and Open Hardware um, Electronics uh, manufacturer in Boulder, just outside of Boulder, Colorado does a lot of educational work and they're preloading all their code samples and code bases onto library boxes and then taking them with them out into when they do middle school and high school educational events and then using that as the, the, point, of, uh, the point of need sharing. Anyone who has ever had to deal with a middle school or high school Wi-Fi network understands why they have to have something to share the information with rather than relying on the internet inside a school because boy howdy that's terrible. Um, this was one of the most surprising uses. Uh, IBM was using a library box um, at a conference to deliver sales materials to people. And I was trying to understand why IBM didn't have a better tool for this, but I'll take it. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll allow it. Uh, the largest single user probably in the nonprofit space at this point for Library Box is, um, and is the American International Health Alliance, a nonprofit that does health education mostly in Africa. They have um, distributed uh, almost 50 Library Boxes in, um, uh, let's see, Zambia, Ethiopia, and South America um, as part of their AIDS education in the area. So they preload Library Boxes with educational information about uh, the prevention of AIDS, and then they take them out, along with some nursing materials and things, and then take them out into very remote communities in Africa to be able to share the information. People have mobile phones but may not have connectivity, and this is an easy way to get them the information they need. And then my very favorite example of a library box use, before we talk a little bit about the future of the box, is um, an English teacher who contacted me from uh, Shenzhen, China, who uh, wrote me an email that said, you know, I'm teaching English in, uh, in this area where I have students from all sorts of, from the a wide range of economic classes. And the students from, from uh, households with, with, you know, not as much money can't afford a VPN to get through the Great Firewall to get the information that I'm suggesting that they read. Uh, and it's blocked. 
the higher economic households have VPNs at home and they can just tunnel through the Great Firewall and it's no big deal. They just get whatever they want. Um, and he, this disparity in the ability, literally just across economic lines, to get information is, I think, at the heart of what I want Library Box to be doing. Um, he would then obviously preload the stuff that he wants and take it into the class and everybody could get to it, regardless of what their home internet situation was like. Um, it's grown, the project keeps growing and I hope to continue this sort of growth. Um, since 2012, we've expanded uh, fairly regularly throughout the world. Uh, this, is last month's, uh, this is last month's data that I have. Uh, because it's an offline sharing device, it, it doesn't connect to anything. It's an island. I don't actually have a way to track <laughs> because I can't poke it, right? It doesn't connect to anything. Um, so I kind of rely on the community to tell me where library boxes, library boxen, have been, you know, installed. So this is the, the community's report to me of where, where library boxen have been, um, have been placed. Uh, we're up to about 33 states, 37 countries, and six continents. And I have said this every time I've talked about Library Box, but if anyone knows anyone that goes to Antarctica regularly, I really want to get a Library Box on that seventh continent. So I will happily send them one for free if anybody knows someone who regularly goes back and forth to Antarctica. So uh, I, will, I will happily, happily make that happen. And if any community knows somebody that regularly goes to Antarctica, it's probably this one. So tell me. Um, yeah. What? Let's uh, excellent. Fantastic. That's, that's great. I really want to get one on that seventh continent. OK, so I'm here uh, as a Berkman Fellow this year to work on this project, to push it forward, to make it more interesting, to make it do more, to make more people aware of it, all of these sorts of things, right? So what sorts of things am I looking to do over the next year. Put another way, what are the sorts of things that I would love this community to help me do over the next year? Um, and uh, there are a number of them, some of them technical and some of them not. The technical ones are things like, um, I would love to find a reliable way for the devices to mesh network together. We have some very rough mesh code in the release right now where it does some automatic syncing, but it's not true kind of networked mesh. Um, and that would be interesting to do small local networks with these devices. Encryption and security is another one. Because these devices are offline, they don't obviously connect to the internet. They're little islands. They can't use the traditional mechanisms that websites use to secure themselves. SSL is right out because you can't have trusted security certificates not talking to the rest of the world. So um, figuring out exactly how to make that happen is something that I would really like to do. I would love to have more secure connectivity on, uh, on library boxes. Uh, content packs on the non-technical side, I would really like to work with people who are interested in education and curricula and develop open access curricula for, de for deployment on boxes so that we could put together you know, a school in a box and give it out to people. That would be really fantastic. Um, custom hardware is something that I'm interested in. I, um, I, I'm, I'm very, very interested in open hardware and pushing kind of what open hardware can do. So I'm interested in kind of working on what the hardware choices are for our, our code base. And then, of course, you know, funding. Everybody needs funding all the time for all their projects. So that's something that I'm, I'm hoping to work on. The thing that really at the bottom, right, like all of the open access to information, share, easy sharing of information, all of this stuff is, you know, deeply held um, as, a, as, a, as a core need for, as, as, as a core thing for this project. The thing that interests me about the project, though, goes deeper than just that level. The thing that really interests me is the stuff that's kind of five, four years from now, five years from now. Um, everyone knows uh, Gordon Moore's law about, you know, chips getting faster and cheaper over time. Kumi's law is one that's less known, but has to do uh, with the same time frame. Every 18 months, a computer chip uh, does the same amount of processing for half as much power. So the power curve goes down over the course of, uh, over the course of time. And when you combine the two, right, you have um, 
all of our electronic stuff gets better, faster, cheaper, and uses less power. So um, these boxes run on about um, three and a half to five volts. They're incredibly power efficient little things. They'll run on solar panels. Um, but what happens when you're able to have these, right, even smaller, even cheaper, even more energy efficient, uh, even more memory? As these sorts of things become smaller and easier for people to implement, I think that the concept of individuals having their library, if you'd like to, to, to co-op the word for it, that they bring into the world and share with you is an interesting one because that's going to get easier and easier and easier and easier and easier for people to do. And it is going to increasingly confound uh, copyright law, right? Um, that, that gets easier and easier and easier for people to do and harder and harder and harder to track because these are not connected to the net and you can't just know that someone is sharing, right? You can't uh, audio fingerprint the YouTube video and send a DMCA takedown because it's not online. And those things are very, very interesting. As we move into the so-called internet of things, which is a phrase that drives me crazy, uh, but as we move in that direction of everything in the world having uh, an IP address, I'm really interested in people controlling that and having the devices on open hardware and open source software that control and allow those things to happen rather than relying on the corporate overlords to, to provide it to us. So the long game is making things that make it easier for people to control their own information um, as a result of being easier to use and cheaper. That's the long game for this project. So that's it. Um, that's Library Box. Um, we'll have a lot of time for questions. So, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. That's uh, Library Box, and that's me. If you want to contact me afterwards, if you have to run for something and don't have time for the questions. So, thanks, guys. So let's have a let's have a discussion. <laughs> oh, we got to, um, I think that first hand was over there and then Nathan. Sorry, I'm on the ground, so you shouldn't be able to see me. Um, this, my hey. name's Mary Gray, my fellow this year. Uh, this looks hey. so fascinating. And I think the thing that caught me was um, at the end when you're, when you're imagining, you know, the incredible shrinkage, um, is that necessary to the vision? Because if I, if I think about some of the critiques of, of kind of positioning that as a law with a big L, what would what have you thought through what you get out of keeping it at this really fantastic portability, and where you would go with that? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, I, I do think that shrinkage. I, I do think that uh, Moore and Kumi are fairly inevitable. I mean, I know that there are you know, physical limits, and electrons only want to be so close together, and uh, yeah, I, I know all that stuff. Um, but uh, I don't think that the march of those two laws is going to slow any time in five, 10 years even probably. Um, these are great, like, they, like you said, these are, I mean, you know, these are fantastic little devices. They easily fit in a pocket. Um, I think one of the more interesting things that might come from the march of at least Kumi's law is, so you've got these two, two separate pieces of hardware. Um, this larger one is heavier and has a 10,000 milliamp hour battery in it. This one is much smaller, just a, you know, a little over the size of a credit card and has, I think, a 2,200 milliamp hour battery in it. This runs for about five or six hours. This runs for about three days. And like, if they got more and more energy efficient, I think that's better for remote uses, right? So the more energy efficient we can make them, I think that's a win for everyone. I would love to be able to have something that was you know, half this size that ran on uh, you know, a solar panel that big. <laughs> like, that would be fantastic if we could get that level of, of power um, going. Um, I think Nathan was next. I know one of the ways you contrast Library Box with Pirate Box is that Library Box is read only. Yeah. And Pirate Box, you know, you can upload and share. So, sure. at the same time, it seems like libraries are becoming more of a commons for sharing <coughs> and creating and remixing. Sure. So, how, 
I know why you've done it in sort of V1, V2. Yeah. Do you, is there a read-write future for Library Box? Yeah, I definitely think that there is. I mean, I, I think the, you're, you're completely right that the future of libraries is the collection of information from their communities. I mean, the, the history of libraries is the collection of information from their communities as well. We've kind of lost that in the midst of the, well, commercial copyright uh, world. Uh, so long term, I, I definitely think so. Using one of these as a, as a story box where you go out into the world and you collect your, your patrons' stories, photographs, those sorts of things, I think is a really powerful use for this sort of tech. Um, the reason initially that I went with the no uploading, right, as an interface choice uh, was, was, was purely to make libraries comfortable with it, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's way easier to sell it, <laughs> uh, to not sell it, but to make, them, uh, make it available for their use um, if they are not worried about it. So it was marketing more than, more than obviously, tech. Um, there are a few other differences at this point. We've, we support each other. Pirate Box and Library Box support each other. We've run our code bases back and forth a couple of times at this point where the installation process that we did for the V2 went into the Pirate Box core code, and so we've... We work together well. <laughs> I can see us working together more. Uh, yeah, up here. Question. Sure. Um, what sort of what sort of capacities do you have in it now in terms of memory storage sure. and so forth? Yeah. Um, uh, second is. Uh, uh, well, actually, I'll just do two. To make it shorter. Second is. Um, is there anything about this that couldn't possibly be fundamentally implemented as a cell phone app on a WAP, <coughs> uh, you know, a yep. access point enabled cell phone? Yep. That, great, great questions. So uh, for my bent on the technology, right, the limitation for uh, drive storage is the USB that you throw at it. So, yeah, so you can, you can do a number, I mean, to actually get into it, um, you can do a number of things. If you're doing things kind of deeper into the, the, the Linux part of it, which is OpenWRT, uh, is the Linux uh, underbelly that we use. You can uh, tell or SSH in and you know, just go to town. Uh, if you want to customize the look or the feel of the UI, that's all on the, on the USB key, as well as all of the shared files. So if you just want to put a new book on it, all you have to do is turn it off, pull the USB, throw it in your computer, load stuff, put it back in, turn it on. Um, same with customizing the website, that it delivers you, anything like that. All of that is on the USB. Um, and the sec what was the second again? Second question? Oh, you, smartphone, smartphone use. Yes, as a matter of fact, Pirate Box has a Android app that does, um, that does act as a, effectively as a Pirate Box. It is entirely possible that we would eventually go that way. Um, there are two reasons that we haven't. One is, is cost. So um, let me see, I think this is the cheapest one I've got up here. So this box is about $22. Right, <laughs> like it's hard to beat for an access point that you can put in your pocket and you can carry around with you. Um, even with smartphone prices going through the floor, I think it's going to be a little while before we hit 22 bucks for the ability to do this sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that's. Um, a lot of the communities that libraries serve and a lot of the places where the education market is may not have the sort of smartphone that can run apps, right? And that's a worry. Eventually, totally. I mean, that, we're going that direction, right? Like, everybody's going to have a smartphone at some point. Uh, yeah, sir. In the back. Adrian Gropper. Uh, a f many months ago, uh, we had a talk here like this, like yours. <coughs> from a person talking about the importance of owning your router. Yeah, And sure. you talk in, um, uh, you mentioned the ability to have automatic upgrades, mm -hmm. uh, as well as, as was brought up, uh, the yeah. read-write capability. Yeah. Uh, at what point does the library box have to merge with your router for any of these reasons? In other words, Will these be separate things, or are they invariably going to have to merge in terms of owned hardware, sovereign hardware? Um, I, I see the, the, the kind of the roles of the kind of traditional Wi-Fi router and the roles of a library box different. Obviously, this is a router. That's what it does. That's what the hardware is built to do. Um, but I think it is, 
from my perspective, philosophically important that this never be on the internet. Like the part of the strength of the project is that this, none of these boxes connect to the broader web. And that in some ways is um, a, a, a problem because we can't tell where they're being used, right? And I can't push an update to them. Uh, but I can give, we can, when I said automatic updates, um, what I meant was you put a file on the thing, you put it in and you turn it on and it works. It, you know, it updates itself. Um, keeping it air gapped from the real internet, I think is part of the strength of the tech. And if you build it into the router, obviously that's all, all bets are off. So I think that having it as a separate thing philosophically is an important piece. So um, you say it's air-gapped, but it's connecting to machines that will connect to the internet. It, can, it could, true, and, totally and true. I do. I think that you know, from the use cases you're describing, in some cases, it's going to be operating in a hostile environment where yeah. this device Absolutely. might be gathering the details of what media people are accessing, and then that's a very attractive target. So yes. What? How much? I mean, you're talking about encryption. How much yeah. have you engineered for for that use case? Well, that's uh, that is one of the things I want to do this year. Is okay. is over engineer uh, the safety of the network traffic that's passing through it as devices connect. Um, as I I'm, you know I mentioned very briefly, the traditional way of doing it on the web just doesn't work. Right? You can't have an SSL cert. And, and another one there might be the state on the box, like what kind of logging is it doing and, or not doing? Yes, that's a, that's a fine point. Uh, because this was built with uh, the initial code base and the initial concept was all built with libraries in mind. It's not doing any logging, no Mac tracking, uh, none of that. The, it keeps statistics of um, links clicked, but there's no IP and no Macs re related to any of that that's ever on the box. So yeah, it, secure, privacy is... Darius. Uh, when I showed the map, it would seem that most of the users are in the US or yes. Europe. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether this is because you know the libraries can afford it more there, or is it it's, the, the, the reports are more abundant from this area, or is it like a personal network that yeah. is affecting this? I think it's a combination of a number of things. I mean, yeah, obviously, like it's easier for me to evangelize in the US, right? Like it's easier for me to I go to national conferences and I talk about this. So uh, the fact that the user base is larger in the US, um, I think has a lot to do with the fact that more people have heard of it. It's just simple marketing. Um, Europe was um, interesting for, for reasons that I am not entirely clear on. One of the largest initial groups to latch onto the project was in France. And from there, um, it spread fairly quickly. The, one of the lead developers for the project is in Germany as well, and that helps in kind of getting information in, uh, in Europe. So that may explain it, but that's, that's a fine thing. I would love to know more. I mean, that obviously is something else I could probably, I could do while I'm here, is work on kind of how it's been distributed and why the kind of social net that has done it is something that's really interesting to me. Uh, yes, sir. Um, a couple of questions about content. Uh, sure. How much can you put on the box? Yeah. And um, I would think that reading from a, a mobile application would be really um, ideal for this. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have a way of um, optimizing the content uh, for uh, reading on mobile devices as opposed to browsers and other things? Sure. So, um, so the, the only limit for storage is the USB that you connect to it. So uh, if you, you may not be able to see very clearly, but you can come up and take a look at the devices afterwards. Uh, there's a little USB, a little thumb drive, and the thumb drive is your hard drive. So if you connect a, a 16 gig thumb drive, you've got 16 gigs of storage. If you connect a 128, you've got 128 gigs. If you connect an external hard drive and you plug it in and you've got a four terabyte RAID, you've got four terabytes of of storage, it's it's entirely dependent upon the the external uh, external storage for that. Um, we have again, uh, kind of philosophically, intentionally not optimized for any particular kind of content. Um, that is both that is intentional. Um, it is up to the client that connects to be able to read the content in question. So if you throw um, 
uh, if you throw an MP4 at a phone that doesn't have an MP4 uh, decryption you know, program, um, if it can't read the codec, then it can't read the file. But that also <laughs> means that we can serve anything. So you want to serve huge data sets to people? Fine, throw them on here and give them something that can read huge data sets and they can pull it off, right? Totally agnostic as to the, the digital thing that you want to share. So and it also means that uh, we can stay within web standards for the sharing, which means that any browser can access it. So we've had discussions with people about optimizing with an app, right? Having a, an iOS or an Android app that connected directly to the box and was the interface for getting content off. But again, that, um, that walls you, it doesn't free you. So we wanna make it as accessible as possible. So. That, that just makes me wonder, there's some new stuff that's coming out with the uh, uh, WLAN, authentic, you know, Wi-Fi authentication that yeah. might be interesting to do that sort of automated login. Yeah, there's a there's a handful there was a there's a there's a handful of, of newer Wi-Fi things that I would love to look into. There's a um, uh, a corporate Wi-Fi thing that I looked at very briefly that does end-to-end -end encryption um, without using SSL. Um, that one didn't go very far, but I hope to find something that does because yeah, it would be ideal. That's what I want is for it to be end-to-end -end encrypted on every device. Yeah, in the back. Hi, uh, hey. I've been working on uh, one laptop for child school server for many years. Sure. And, uh, it's kind of a larger version of this. Yeah. And uh, well, first the good news. Um, <laughs> when, when I worked in Madagascar and Ghana, people prefer this to the internet. Yeah. And the so-called whites can't. They because they're addicted to Google and they're addicted <laughs> to their smartphones. So there's a limited window because it's faster. Yeah, The much content faster. is closer yeah. and it's a cultural divide. Yeah. You know, we cannot resist grabbing Google in our pocket. We just can't, we're addicted to it. So there's a kind of a limited time to deploy these things, whether yeah. it's 10 years or whatever. Yeah. Um, and my perspective, so this is a pessimist, so you're supposed to be the okay. optimist, is that it's not going to work unless we have an incredibly powerful brand name yeah. like Wikipedia or United Nations or pick your favorite, you know, yeah. private, public, whatever. Um, because the costs <clears throat> to deploy are much larger than the cost of the hardware. Oh, yeah. Now, we all have $10 units, $100 units. I consider that completely irrelevant. Yeah. The deployment costs are the real costs. And so unless we find a way to become Henry Ford, <laughs> this will remain a tinkerer's game, an interesting tinkerer's game. Yeah. 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 I, don't, I don't disagree. I would love to become Henry Ford. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Part of Henry Ford. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ellery. Um, yeah. Just going off of that, can you talk about how, like, how do I get it if I sure. live in Zambia and totally. I don't know you yeah. or me or any of us? I mean, I think totally. just a lot of these tools, like, they're really cool yeah. and can be useful in context yeah. with low connectivity, but yeah. the how do you get it if you don't have a credit card, if you don't, if Absolutely. ordering something online is not an option, yeah. Yeah. and you're not connected to these kind of networks, and then yeah. how do you know how to use it? Yeah, how, the, the last mile problem is a real one, and uh, especially for physical goods. Um, I, you know, part of the goal of the project has been to make it as easy as possible to install, to build, right? So uh, we have, intentionally tried to support international versions of all of the hardware. So you can go to a local electronics store in much of the world. I won't say all of the world because I don't know all of the world, but much of the world. You can go into a local electronics store and buy whatever the local version of this hardware is because TP-Link, these are all TP-Link routers. Well, okay, three of them are TP-Link routers. They're a global company. Um, you can buy some version of this that we support almost everywhere. Now, if you're in a remote area that doesn't have an electronic store, obviously that's a problem. Um, as far as building it, you do need initial access to be able to build it. So the, you know, the implementation can't take place in a vacuum. 
and um, honestly, I, I don't have a solution for how do you build it in the middle of you know, nowhere. Um, we can slowly start answering that question maybe through better, better methodologies for installing it from you know, offline, but we're not there yet. No. But we have tried to make sure that we support some version of hardware that is available, uh, you know, again, on every continent in most countries, um, uh, certainly anywhere that anyone has contacted me and said, you know, I haven't been able to find the MR3020. Our local version is the WR173. Okay, well, we'll now build it for the WR173, you know. So we've tried to hit when people ask. But, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. Uh, have you talked to Fab Lab communities at all um, to kind of following off of that and, um, you know, could you make a library box that makes other library boxes essentially, yeah. right? Like sure. the, the plans on it, right, the information yeah. that you need, maybe yeah. two USB ports so that you can copy over the, yep. the code. You can, act, you can build a box from a box, yes. That's totally doable and legit and works and is fairly easily done. Um, so yes, once you have one, you can have many. Um, the, uh, the Fab Lab community is one of my favorite communities in the whole world. I absolutely love, love, love all things maker, makerspace, fabbing. Um, working with SparkFun um, on a couple of projects has introduced me to wide swaths of that community. And yes, I would adore working with them more, especially on the open hardware front to try to free, I mean, these are, um, you know, open source code, but the hardware on this particular box is not open. Um, which bothers me, and I would like to continue to work with communities to make it more so. To riff off of the, I'm Willow, hello everyone. Um, to riff off of the idea of, of Fab Labs and data that you brought up yeah. earlier and openness, yeah. I do a fair amount of hackathons in places with low connectivity and mm. being able to walk in with the libraries and the Yep. And the data would be dreamy because <laughs> the power is never reliable and yep. the connectivity is never reliable. And yep. taking enough with me to be able to leave them yeah. um, would be great. Yeah. Well, that's, I, that is exactly the sort of use case that I think this particular project shines with. That is, that is almost exactly SparkFun's use case. Like, right, they have pre-built all their libraries and everything into a box, and they just take it with them, and it, the, the box costs $40. They just... Leave it with the school. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, to follow up on that question, wouldn't it make sense for all of us to have this software on our laptops? Well, your laptop can't run off a solar panel typically um, and uh, probably isn't going to be uh, quite that size. Right. I mean, so. Oh. Sure, sure, sure. But again, like you, 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 I mean, there are really cheap laptops. So you know, if you have a fifty-dollar laptop, sure, you can leave it behind. Um, the uh, the the goal of this is to try to push the price down to the point. I mean, one of the goals is to try to make it, you know, absolutely. I want these things in like you know, cereal box hardware. I want it to be as cheap as humanly possible to roll out. Um, to give you, so I did, br yeah. So I've talked a couple of times about solar panels. I brought one just to, you know, the, these boxes will run if you're in full sun on a solar panel this size. So it doesn't take a lot of space if you're running it in a remote area. So, so I think with they, a lot of these questions you're hearing about, can it be an app? Can it be on my laptop? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've rolled my own version of this 20 yeah. times in the sure. last 10 years. And I think everyone should maybe, in some ways I think you're, stuck on the thing of the box versus the thing yeah. of the light box and that like maybe it's better if people say oh I've set up a web server on my LAN and you can it's like oh I put up a library box yeah and maybe it has nothing to do with your software or your hardware it's just it's a now a verb I library boxed it or yeah. I would love to be a verb that'd be awesome I mean, Henry Ford and a verb that'd yeah I mean it's a concept that the idea that you don't need the internet yeah that you have the right to share freely licensed content and that this is something you should do as a community act or a resistant act or something. Like, that's a bigger gift to the state yeah. of the world than, like, selling your box. Yes. So. Totally agree. Yeah, you know that. Yeah. No, that's well said. Thank you, Nate. 
Um, I was sort of impressed by the, the picture you put in your presentation showing a sort of a bookshelf that was half empty with just a little library <laughs> box. I was reminded of the own if efforts uh, we've been having in my department at the University of Geneva of downsizing some of our libraries because they were saying, yeah, you have everything online, you have everything digitized anyway. So I was wondering, do you have any policy standpoints regarding uh, the issue of uh, the digital dark age? The idea that every data is now digital and we'll have big, we're, we're going to have trouble uh, getting back to our own history and getting back to uh, to to our data like 50 years from yeah. now. I definitely, I mean, obviously there are lots of libraries that have thought about that. There's probably librarians in the room that are more qualified to talk about that than me, honestly. Um, uh, I do think that I, one of the things, again, kind of philosophically that makes me continue to be interested in this project and projects like it is the idea that it is possible for people to easily and cheaply you know be their own archive right to that their information can easily be kept and shared by themselves um, and I think that that I mean that again kind of concept is fairly powerful once you start you know start seeing it in the world Got through all the questions? You have one more? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, no Sort problem. of a semi comment. And actually, uh, the image that just came to me, I recall, I think it started around 10 years ago, where you'd see people, especially kind of geeky people at geeky events, who would have their, you know, uh, uh, USB thumb drive hanging around their neck with all of their vital stuff. This sort of strikes me as like a, yeah. a, you know, a USB thumb drive that broadcasts. Yeah. Um, but I think that the uh, question raised here is really, when you look ahead, um, I mean, uh, with the technology changing as rapidly as it is, the notion that you can rely on archiving in these forms starts to get a little dicey, doesn't it, down the road? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you know, no data format is is immutable or you know immune from bit rot or any number of other um, you know problems. Digital information storage over time, both in codec and in just again physical storage. I mean, f physically storing digital things is hard if what you want is absolute bit for bit copies. Um, yeah, I, I do not think this is a you know magic archive box. <laughs> that is just that is just not what this is, and um, uh, this really is more about sharing than archival. But as a as a potential point, as as I you know said to, to Nathan's question a little earlier, um, the potential point for using it as a collection device and then moving it into the archival sort of um, a more stable archival form, I think is. A fairly interesting one. This could be the shuttlecraft for the mothership, right? So, sure. thanks, Gary. Just a, a tiny pushback on the laptop question. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things uh, we're playing with in our kind of one laptop per child, the server yeah. world is, uh, um, uh, well, not officially. It's kind of a, an underground hack of the old OPC laptops to turn them into something like this. Yeah. Uh, because there's about three million of these, you know, littered around the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the cost is zero, right? Yeah. Literally yeah. zero, because they're they're being pushed out of schools and they're easy to find, right? Yeah. So why pay anything when it's completely free? So you have a screen as well, and yeah. and maybe the laptop is actually a better form factor, because if you're looking at cultural adoption, um, you, you're not demanding someone have any fancy smartphone, low-end smartphone, anything. Yeah. And you've, as one of the gentlemen over here, I forget, said, you, you have an AP, you're, you're spreading the knowledge through the little village. Yeah. And do you, do you consider that form factor possible oh, as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's, I, I, no, I mean, I, I mean, the OLPC project in general is a great one. Uh, the, the particular reuse of it, I mean, I, it is a fantastic idea to reuse old, old hardware in this way. That is uh, really... Yes, I mean, both environmentally friendly and it's just an awesome use of old hardware. Um, I mean, we, again, like my particular project hasn't gone that route because we don't have access to three million free laptops. Um, 
<laughs> you got it. <laughs> I will happily talk to you about, about using them. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, the, the form factor, again, kind of philosophically, form factor doesn't matter at all. It's more about the kind of reconceptualizing the way that we share things, being able to do it very, very, very cheaply in areas with no infrastructure, honestly. I think that's an important reconceptualization of the way we share digital things. So I think we have time for one more question, okay. if anyone would one like. One more? And I didn't even look at what time it was. So, All right, so last one. No pressure. I didn't want to take the mic if somebody else had something to say. Um, well, I was, I was going to say, and I don't know, this is probably obvious to most people in the room, but this is like such a lovely example of values and design. Oh, so you, you. you've really embedded um, a philosophical, several philosophical positions in your, yeah. in your build. And I, I missed the very beginning of your talk, so I'm not sure if you laid out kind of the philosophical principles that are there. Yeah. And I did want to introduce, at one point you used the word, we're kind of agnostic to what the data is. Yeah. Those places where um, there is very much a, a philosophical position, that means you can't necessarily make claims to agnosticism, and if you, if you maybe agree or disagree with that statement. But it just does seem like such yeah. an interesting example for people like me who would say, oh, actually your values are absolutely baked into what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. um, this is like par excellence of what we're talking about when we say that. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, the, you know, I, I am by training uh, a librarian. I have spent time uh, as a librarian over the last decade. Um, it is fairly clear to anyone that knows librarians and libraries that there is a, the philosophical basis of it is pretty firmly rooted in the library world. Um, open and free access to information everywhere all the time. Um, agnosticism about what people are reading <laughs> is a core library value, right? We don't care what you read as long as you're reading. Um, we don't even want to know what you read. We just want you to read. Um, we don't care. Uh, so all of those sorts of library values, I think, are um, are part of the uh, are part of the underbelly of, of this project. At least I hope they are. I want them to be, and it makes me really happy that you think they are, um, because that is, I think, a piece of what I want to uh, put out with the project is those those positions. Um, it is one of the ways that we differentiate ourselves from all of the other potential projects, right? There are other ways to do this as, again, I keep relating back to, to, to Nathan. Um, he, you know, he said, people have rolled their own on this sort of thing a lot. Um, there are other ways you can do this, but we have a particular bent and we want a particular thing out of the project. And um, I'm willing to, you know, I'm, I'm willing to make the decisions that make it go the way we want. So thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. I'll put my. All right. There's me again. If you, if you want to get in touch, uh, I would love to hear from anyone and everyone. So thank you so much. And if you want to come up and look at stuff, whatever, come on up. <laughs>